we'll wait one more minute for uh, begin exactly on time. So one more minute and then we'll start. So I'm going to start. Uh, I'll start again. I'll start in about two minutes. Just give a little more time for people who are log are coming on board, and uh, then we'll start. We have over a hundred people registered, so it's taking a little bit of time for everyone to come uh, come and join us. And we're going to just wait one more minute, and then I'll start the session. I hope everybody has a beautiful day there where you are, as we do in Geneva. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna start the session now. So we have to get, we have a very distinguished guest. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to have you all with us. I hope you are all healthy and safe. And I'd like to welcome you to this IOE Digital Conference on Economic Advocacy for SMEs Tackling the COVID-19 Crisis. I'm Jean Milligan, Director of Communications at the International Organization of Employers, IOE. And I'm pleased to be moderating this very timely exchange organized by IOE on World MSME Day. So we kindly ask everyone a little housework to mute the, your microphones, except the speakers, of course. So thank you. And we're going to start this dialogue by uh, giving the floor to IOE President Errol Kiriseppi for some welcome remarks. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jean. Dear Secretary General of UNCTA, Dr. Tutui, Excellency Ambassador Jose Luis Cancela, Permanent Representative of Uruguay to the WTO, Distinguished Representatives of the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, ILO, and IPC, with colleagues and friends. It is a great pleasure and honor to be here today on the occasion of the World Day of MSMEs with such a distinguished panel. We are gathering today in a digital manner and in the context of a very peculiar situation. We meet in the middle of a health emergency situation that has largely impacted our lives and livelihoods. I hope that all of you and your families remain safe and healthy. Our world today is dealing with a crisis of monumental proportions. The effects on the global economy puts a great pressure on the sustainable development of our nation. The necessary measures of confinement have created one of the most challenging environments for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in modern history and severely disrupted many existing value chains. SMEs are the backbone of national and the global economy. They represent more than 
90% of businesses and more than 50% of employment worldwide. In emerging markets, most formal jobs are generated by SMEs. Yet, SMEs are highly vulnerable and less resilient. Most of them face high risks of serious disruption. As president of the International Organization of Employers, the largest network of the private sector in the world, I have witnessed the enormous efforts that the different stakeholders at the international level are doing to help SMEs to navigate the crisis. However, institutional collaboration and joint action are now more urgent than ever. Working together, we can restore livelihoods and bring the global economy back on track. I take this opportunity as president of the IOE family and global business community to raise global awareness of the urgent need to secure the resilience of SMEs. To call for urgent and coordinated action to restore trade and supply chains and to seek efficient and innovative means to mitigate the economic and social effects of the pandemic. We at the IOE look forward to strengthening our partnerships with the United Nations, as well as other financial stakeholders at the global level. Businesses are 100% committed to work on the economic recovery of our nations and the realization of a better normal after the pandemic. I wish you a very successful exchange. I hand it back to you, Jean, that you will guide us through this promising conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Now we're going to move to our distinguished panelists. And we have with us today, Dr. Mukiza Itui, the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UCTAD, His Excellency Ambassador Jose Luis Cancela, Permanent Representative of Uruguay to the World Trade Organization here in Geneva, and coordinator of the WT inform, WTO Informal Working Group on MSMEs. We also have Philippe, excuse my pronunciation, Hager, advisor to the executive director, of the World Bank, Laurent Morin, senior economist at the European Investment Bank, Dragan Radic, head of the Small and Medium Enterprises Unit of the International Labour Organization, and Rajesh Agarwal, Chief of the Trade Facilitation and Policy for Business, Department of Market Development at the International Trade Center. Thank you all for joining us. We know you have very tight schedules, so we appreciate your making time for us today. So I just want to give you some information. This conference is going to be divided into three parts. First, Dr. Kituyi and Ambassador Tanchala will offer insight into how their organizations are mobilizing on behalf of SMEs. And then we'll follow their interventions with questions and we'll take questions from the chat room. Following that, we will proceed with our other panelists. We will then follow that by questions and then we'll have some closing remarks from our Secretary General, Roberto Suarez Santos. Uh, just to signal to you, there's the chat function as you're all probably familiar with and we will be following closely any questions and comments that you make. So we will Without further delay, let me pass to our first speaker, Dr. Kituyi. UCTAD has been one of the global leaders in advocating for international economic relief for SMEs in response to this disruption. Can you tell us what role should national and international investment policies play in tackling the economic and social effects of the COVID-19 crisis? Dr. Kituyi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, may I first uh, express my appreciation to the Interna International Organization of Employers and the other participants in convening this important discussion uh, on the eve of a historically important day, which I hope that in the future will galvanize international attention and define our engagement over the following year in support to micro and medium enterprises. Uh, we at UNCTAD believe first and foremost that the best way to deal with a challenge is to try to understand its anatomy and therefore 
to try to find solutions to the challenges for MSMEs starts by understanding what are those challenges. We have been documenting uh, the economic impact of the pandemic. For example, the 40% decline in global FDI flows, uh, the first 5% in first quarter and projected 20% decline in international trade, uh, the collapse in the market of certain commodities, the 80% collapse in the uh, hospitality industry with attended laws of informal sector supplementary jobs that are actually a domicile of many SMEs in um, tourism dependent countries like small island developing states. Now, understanding that is at the core of now finding solutions. So that is one level of understanding. A second level of understanding is that the challenges in the landscape for SMEs is partly due to pre-existing conditions. What do I mean? The unraveling, first of all, the slow recovery of the global economy since the crisis of 2008, which was not sufficiently over, exacerbated, made conditions very difficult when the pandemic came along. For example, FDI flows have been very steadily but very, very modestly recovering over the past decade. And our projection of a 40% decline in FDI this year means that for the first time since the year 2005, global FDI flows will be below $1 trillion. US dollars. That has a significance in what hits the small enterprise. Now, the second level is to deal with uh, the reorganization of global production networks. We have seen a very substantial reshoring in the recent past, which is an ongoing phenomenon, often driven by technology, abetted by the rise of economic nationalism, and got in the crosshairs of technology cold war between leading uh, international players. When in many developing countries, even in developed countries, SMEs, MSMEs are usually the last into an enterprise, supplying complementary services to major players in global production networks, usually a niche in the manufacturing area. What happens when those networks are unruffled or the investment becomes reassured or production networks become more regionalized and dramatic decline in opportunities and the requirement for totally new thinking about what are the target opportunities, what are the levers of survival become very, very clear. So these are some of the macro issues that we have to deal with on SMEs with the pandemic. But then there's another plane we have to look at. The reality that in many societies, small, small informal and formal enterprises often are overrepresented in the people on the front line of enterprise, even during the lockdown. Whether you're a fuel pump attendant or you supply grocery on the corner of the street where people come uh, to take for takeaway services, or you are a driver for delivery of uh, remotely procured uh, services, the reality is that disproportionately vulnerable people are in the front line of physical contact with the virus. And you're seeing how service industry people have had a disproportionate share of the infections during the lockdown period. So these are some of the challenges. But now come, how do we model policies at national and regional level to deal with the challenges of SMEs? One, we know that in many prospering sectors, SMEs are the last on board and the first off board. When enterprises driven by multinational enterprises grow, they give supplier contracts to small enterprises often in the local production area, but when times get hard, they are the first ones to disappear as uh, suppliers in the network. There's a second phenomenon here also that um, in the hospitality industry, which is one of the largest employers in the small business world, it is a reality that the first jobs to be jettisoned are the suppliers of uh, non-essential services, flowers, entertainers, uh, cure, uh, creative arts producers, in the hospitality value chain. And often they are the first ones to be lost as the industry starts struggling. So if you just look at that, 
you are also to see there's another side to it, which is the gender imbalance in the vulnerability to declining services industry. If we are going to find sustainable solutions to the price of SMEs going forward, we should know that women run enterprises, and particularly women employees in the hospitality industry, who are usually occupying the niche of food provision, uh, accommodation services, are among the most vulnerable as this sector starts retracting. Geographical spread, we are seeing crisis everywhere. But imagine you are looking at the small island developing states, while globally tourism is 10% of GDP. In the seeds, it's 30%. In Maldives, Grenada, and, 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 and Neville, it is more than 50% of GDP. So combine the crisis, the, the, the air industry, and the death throes of uh, cruise tourism, and you see the vulnerabilities that can threaten national, economic, and political life. How do we move in? We must see that states fashion the ability of instruments that can effectively reach the most vulnerable. How do I mean? We have seen even in advanced economies that when the government has a stimulus program, it's easier to engage and disburse to multinational enterprises than to reach and disburse available support to small enterprises. Now you consider the challenge of societies where most SMEs are informal enterprises. Sometimes the only encounter with the government is to be frustrated with hostile taxation and compliance requirements. So when you have adversarial relationship with the administration, how do they reach you as friends? That's a challenge. I think one of the challenges for established institutions like employers, for development agencies, for governments, is to have a clear address of what are the failed needs of small enterprises. How can we reach them? And how can we help deal with those failed uh, challenges? Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you for those really very relevant remarks. I really fully on board with this understanding the anatomy of the problem and the issues. I think that that really, and the pre-existing conditions, I think are actually, it's a quite, it's the crucial, it's the crucial element to actually building better as everybody talks about. So thank you for your very, very relevant remarks. We're gonna come back to you in a few minutes with the questions in the chat. So please uh, stay with us. Uh, his Excellency Ambassador Jose Luis Cancela, you coordinate the informal working group on MSMEs at the World Trade Organization. So let me ask you, what role does improved trade finance policy play for SMEs resilience and continued participation in international trade during this period? Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me begin by thanking the International Organization of Employers for inviting me to speak at this meeting to celebrate the Miss Miss Day. Uh, well, as you know, and it was also mentioned by the president of this organization, uh, Miss Miss are estimated to represent about 60% uh, of the employment uh, worldwide and uh, around 95% of the companies globally. So uh, they are also uh, major employers for women and for youngs. And they are also uh, uh, important drivers of innovation. Uh, important, importantly for the Miss Miss informal working group of WTO, uh, Miss, many Miss Miss are also dependent on international trade, either for exported sales or for imported inputs, which is where the group is trying to focus uh, its target efforts. Let me turn now to COVID-19 and its impact on Miss Miss. Miss Miss are particularly exposed to COVID-19 pandemic's economic impact because of its limited access to financial resources and because of their large presence in, in very important uh, sectors of the economy, like food services or tourism, for example. 
and they are particularly affected by social distance measures and transport disruptions. A survey conducted by the Asia Pacific SME Trade Coalition found that half of those SMEs surveyed had a month or less of cash reserves. MISMIs also often lack the resources needed to navigate the current rapid changes in government policies and to deal with application requirements to access COVID-19 business support. Supply chain disruptions from overseas production curtailments and shipping interruptions have also created an existential threat to MISMIs either because of shortages of necessary inputs or through shocks to demand. We don't have to forget that MISMIS are also an important part of global value chains nowadays. The pandemic related challenges uh, add on to the existing trade obstacles encountered by MISMIS, especially access to trade finance and there is a risk that the pandemic could increase these difficulties. The Asian Development Bank found that in 2019, 40% of MISMI trade finance applications were rejected and that the 1.3 trillion US dollars trade finance gap continues to exist. Beyond trade finance, MISMIS also have trouble accessing finance in general, which indirectly impacts their ability to trade. Indeed, without financing solutions, MISMIS cannot pursue international opportunities and therefore, and therefore, and thereafter require uh, um, trade financing. The World Bank estimates that developing countries MISMIS have an unmet finance need of 5.2 trillion US dollars. Some of this gap can be linked to the higher risks and lower returns MISMIS can pose for banks and the lack of traditional collateral owned uh, by MISMIS. Less MISMIS familiarity with financial requirements and documentation mean challenges for them to access capital. So let's briefly recall now the measures put in place by governments for MISMIS to weather the economic crisis. Government first introduced urgent stimulus and financial measures for MISMIS, such as uh, liquidity support to address cash flow issues, to preserve jobs, and to ensure business continuity. These include state loans, postponed tax payments, and wage support. Some governments have also tried to expand trade opportunities by, for example, streaming customs related measures or by reducing customs duties. Other measures introduced have aimed at developing MISMIS resiliency and building their capacity to overcome future shocks to demand and supply, including through support for the adoption of IT solution and digitalization. What the informal working group on MISMIS is doing to support them and mitigate the impact of the current crisis? Well, as seen, access to finance is one of the biggest challenges faced by MISMIS, but it is not the only one. The informal working groups strives to work on all these issues in parallel to support MISMIS more broadly. The informal working group on MISMIS has been working to provide transparency for MISMIS by monitoring fast changing trade measures related to the pandemic, we have also been promoting access to information and support the Global Trade Help Desk as a source of for MISMIS, as a source of, as a source of information 
for mis mistraders. Further, the group is looking to formalize WTO collection and maintenance of mis -mis related information through voluntary provision by members and support of other WTO initiatives to improve data provision. The group also promotes the exchange of good practices among its members regarding MISMI support measures. And it's also looking to increase MISMI awareness by policymakers when developing new regulations that can have an impact on this business, small business. Full implementation of the trade facilitation agreement is another area where the MISMI uh, informal working group is supporting the efforts. Trade barriers and complexities have a disproportionate impact on MISMIS and the TFA could benefit small trade substantially. Given the potential for MISMIS, these stakeholders could benefit from direct contact concerning the agreement's implementation. COVID-19 has also underscored the need for paperless trade. Many regulation still requires hard copy documents for trading goods, and these processes were substantially impacted by the COVID-19 crisis, uh, particularly, particularly by lockdowns and quarantine uh, measures that prohibited the physical presence needed for signing and processing these documents. Ms. Ms. could benefit substantially from trade facilitation measures to streamline information input and data sharing and make trade documents available and fillable online. Finally, enhancing Ms. Ms. access to finance, including trade finance, is an important consideration for the Ms. Ms. informal working group of the WTO. Finance can be a problem for Ms. Ms. in all economies, but especially for developing countries and LDCs where bank penetration is low. Financial digitalization in general holds many opportunities for Ms. Ms. It can provide a record of transactions that makes it easier, that makes it easier to access traditional capital. And it can provide companies with access to cross-border digital payments. However, we know that it also requires ICT infrastructure, technology familiarity, and cybersecurity awareness. The financial difficulties for Ms. Ms. do not stop at capital. They also include access to e-payment systems, which can vary by country and have complex regulations associated with them. E-payment systems are especially important for cross-border payments and e-commerce, uh, which holds many opportunities for Ms. Ms. For example, Ms. Ms. connected to online platforms, which often require access to e-payment systems, are more than five times likely to export. The pandemic has underscored the importance of financial digitalization as in-person transactions were reduced. Identification for financing is another particular challenge for Ms. Ms., especially when it comes to KYC bank requirements. The group is exploring ways that access to legal identifiers could benefit Ms. Ms. access to finance. Overall, more information sharing and ICT capacity building will be needed to improve Ms. Ms. access to, to financial solutions, especially as they apply to digital economy. Building resilience requires a multifaceted approach. Financing solution and digitalization will be important elements of the recovery for Ms. Ms from the current economic downturn. The group endeavors to look at all these issues in a comprehensive manner to support our Ms. Ms.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That's actually very, very useful. I think your point on the digitalization and connectivity element is really the fundamental to rebuilding um, and the paperless world, taking us to that next generation. So thank you for those, those remarks. Uh, we've received a lot of questions. I've received both on WhatsApp and in the chat room. And uh, Secretary General, we have, I think, sort of a, a global overall questions for you about linked to, there is the challenge, of course, as you know, with governmental response and liquidity, injecting liquidity into, into small businesses, and then governments themselves, also, governments themselves also facing liquidity issues. So can you tell me, is UNCTAD involved in assisting or guiding governments and supporting governments in terms of how do they not balance injecting liquidity and in maintaining their capacity to respond? Are you working with governments on this? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, as an organization, we have been at the forefront in a global campaign for three sets of actions on the financial uh, response to COVID. Mm -hmm. The first one is a trillion dollar call for enhanced special drawing rights at IMF, which can be sourced through extended new resources, but also a reassignment of drawing rights from member states which don't need them to those particularly in emerging economies that are in urgent need for this money. A second one is a call for a one trillion dollar uh, debt relief, both standstill, ring fencing, social programs, and extending beyond multilateral and bilateral debt to stop commercial creditors from taking this fiscal space that comes with the debt, debt uh, standstill. And third, a $500 billion universal Marshall Plan for health emergency. Uh, supply, uh, the PPEs, the testing kits, and the necessary medication, and health support, particularly for the most vulnerable economies and sectors of society in response to the pandemic. Now, that is one stage. But the second stage is target support to SMEs. A number of the targeted actions are not just about financial support. For example, strengthening the ability for electronic market visibility of small enterprise produce. The way, for example, uh, a subsidiary of Alibaba uh, has done in rural China, uh, Taobao it's called, being able to get the SME produce in electronic market visibility to go beyond the traditional market possibilities is an important way of mitigating the impact. Secondly, enabling a more inclusive digital services, a marketplace of digital services for small businesses. And this means that in this crisis period, strengthening digital inclusion and lowering the cost of digital services can in a very concrete way contribute. For example, in my own country, Kenya, immediately the COVID came, government working with commercial banks waived charges of transferring money from bank accounts onto mobile platforms. So any person who has a bank account does not need to go to the bank. You withdraw your money or use the money on your mobile phone, phone without paying a service charge. So those in many ways reduce the physical encounters that can exacerbate the condition, but also reduce the transactional cost to smaller enterprises. Being able to build those platforms can be very, very important for assisting. Two other things that I think are important. We have the uh, E-Trade for All pro program, where we're supporting micro entrepreneurs through assisting governments efficiently cross the digital divide in a way that targets small businesses and how they can efficiently integrate into buckets. And the other, Empretech, where we support women entrepreneurs because we know they are the most vulnerable. And when state policies are reducing expenditure, often women are the first on the, on the cutting on the block. So a conscious and purposeful campaign, which we think large enterprises and governments can join in, is affirmative action in times of collective vulnerability by shielding the gains for the most vulnerable in society and by availing recovery credits to the most vulnerable in society at competitive pricing. Thank you. Yes, I think the gender and the gender issue that you raise is really very, very crucial. Um, 
there have been a lot of reports on the vulnerability of women during this particular women entrepreneurs. Ambassador, we have a particular question for you. Is, is blockchain a solution for trade financing? How, is, how, are, how are you using blockchain to improve trade financing? Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that indeed blockchain technologies could provide an important uh, solution uh, to the to the miss miss uh, and the small businesses in general, uh, because uh, I was uh, uh, talking before about uh, technologies, about information technologies, and uh, I think that uh, of course we have still to make some more developments, but blockchain could provide us with a, a I would say quite safe uh, way of uh, recording the, the transactions made by small businesses. As you know, it's quite, I would say, an autonomous uh, way of uh, conducting business, of working. So uh, it, could, uh, it, it has, at the same time, the flexibility needed for conducing the, 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 um, the business, and at the same time, the safety required uh, so to uh, you can be confident of the transactions that have been made through the using of, of these technologies. Uh, but if you allow me, I, I, I'm talking about uh, information technologies. Uh, I would like to tap on uh, digitalization again, because I think one of the most important lessons of this crisis uh, has been uh, the need for uh, expediting uh, customs procedures. And their paperless trade will be an important step forward that will help Miss Miss in this regard. Uh, I was looking through the, through the questions received in the chat and uh, well, I saw that some of them talk about uh, the burden of customs procedures, the burden of bureaucracy for Miss Miss. This is an important burden for them and in cost of time and money. So uh, I think we all governments have a responsibility to streamline this burden for Ms. Ms. At the same time, I saw also some questions regarding the, the financial aspects. And here again, uh, we, we have, of course, base, basically a, a problem of access to traditional finance banking by this means. So I think we, we have also to be creative and share experience regarding other ways of, provider, of providing finance, access to finance for this means. Of course, as we all know, uh, we all have requirements regarding money laundering, regarding uh, terrorism financing that we have to, to abide by, we have to comply with these requirements. But I think that keeping this in mind, we can also be creative and develop ways of facilitating the access to finance for Ms. Ms. And I have to say that uh, some of the members of our group at the WTO, for example, have presented, uh, well, I would say quite ingenious and original uh, systems they have put in place. I'm basically talking about developing countries uh, that includes government and private sector together uh, to create mechanisms through their chambers of commerce, through uh, their public and private institutions to facilitate this access to finance uh, to, to Ms. Ms. Yeah. So for this, yeah. I said before that uh, sharing best yeah. practices is also an, an important part of our work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for that. And uh, we will, the questions, there are several questions and we will provide uh, answers to those that we haven't. But thank you, Ambassador, for providing such a concise uh, response to many questions in the chat room. So Dr. Kituri, I know that you have scheduling and you have other meetings. So again, thank you so much for being part of our conference. And please stay around if you have time but uh, stay as long as your agenda allows. So I'm going now to turn to our other panelists. And now we're looking at time management. So each panelist will have eight minutes to speak. And what I'll do is basically at seven minutes, 30 seconds, I'll just say heads up, you have 30 seconds. And the first person I want to have a conversation with is Philippe Hager. He's the advisor to the executive director at the World Bank. 
And Philip, I have a question is, yesterday the IMF lowered its global growth forecast, predicting a decline of 5% in 2020. So can you give me some details about what's the World Bank strategy to assist SMEs to navigate this contraction and access finance? Thank you, Philip. And Mr. Hager, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Um, and thank you very much uh, for inviting uh, me to this uh, conference on SME um, in the current COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to speak here because uh, supporting SMEs all over the world uh, is one uh, of my major focus uh, uh, in my career. Um, if we go to the first slide, uh, at first, uh, uh, I would like to give you a, a short uh, overview uh, of the World Bank so that uh, uh, everybody knows uh, what we uh, are talking about. Uh, as you know, the World Bank uh, is one of the largest uh, development banks uh, in the world, and uh, um, it uh, consists mainly of uh, four institutions. Uh, the first uh, two bullet points uh, are International Bank of Reconstruction and Development and uh, the International Development uh, uh, Association. And uh, both of these uh, institutions uh, are mainly financing are mainly financing governments uh, to support them uh, in infrastructure projects uh, and also uh, in reform projects. Uh, but for us uh, today, they are not uh, the main focus uh, because we want to focus uh, uh, on the private sector and uh, the private sector arm uh, of the World Bank is uh, uh, the International Finance Corporation, uh, abbreviation IFC. And uh, IFC is uh, providing loans and equity to small and medium-sized enterprises as well as uh, to corporates in the middle income countries, um, as well as uh, in the low income countries. And uh, uh, later on, uh, I'm also going to say a, a few words uh, uh, about MIGA, which is uh, uh, the guarantee agency of the World Bank, uh, which is uh, supporting uh, financing of the private sector, as well uh, as, the pub as the public sector, uh, by providing guarantees. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, uh, I would like uh, to um, explain uh, IFC's COVID-19 uh, emergency response. Uh, the general idea uh, of this response package is uh, to provide liquidity to the enterprises, uh, which uh, are struggling with uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And as time was of the essence, uh, of the, essence uh, the concept for this uh, emergency package was uh, uh, developed uh, and approved by the board uh, already uh, in the middle of March. So really uh, directly uh, after the crisis uh, uh, broadly spread. And, and so, uh, everything was uh, in place very fast. Uh, altogether, the IFC uh, emergency package for SMEs uh, uh, and corporate consists of four windows and amounts uh, uh, altogether uh, to 8 billion USD. Uh, so let me uh, explain the four different windows. Uh, one window, which is probably more for the bigger uh, enterprises uh, and corporates, is uh, uh, that IFC is providing loans directly to the companies um, in all the different sectors um, and to all uh, existing clients of IFC, which uh, um, are struggling with uh, the COVID-19 uh, issues. Then uh, the other three windows uh, are implemented via financial intermediaries. And this involvement of uh, financial intermediaries uh, enables uh, IFC to also reach out uh, to the smaller and uh, to micro enterprises because uh, uh, then the financial intermediaries are actually 
uh, on lending uh, the money uh, to the MSMEs. There we have uh, uh, the global trade finance program. Um, and as it was uh, discussed before, uh, trade finance is uh, um, a very important uh, feature always, but especially now that we are uh, in the crisis uh, and we see that uh, international value chains uh, and international trade finance uh, uh, is interrupted uh, or at least at risk uh, of being interrupted. And there uh, IFC is uh, uh, taking over some part of the risk, uh, of the credit risk uh, to ensure uh, that these uh, international trade finance flows uh, are maintained. Uh, then we have uh, the working capital window uh, in which IFC provides credit lines to emerging market banks and helps them uh, to maintain their liquidity and uh, also uh, uh, ensure that they have uh, the funding uh, to provide working capital lines to the local SME clients. Then uh, the third one um, is uh, uh, the global trade liquidity window. And uh, uh, in that one, uh, IFC offers local banks the possibility to transfer like a whole part um, of their corporate loan portfolio to IFC so that they have less, ri uh, less risks uh, in their books and uh, can continue uh, to provide to provide loans to SMEs uh, uh, in their local markets. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, then to give you an idea what that early start meant, uh, I also want to show you the first uh, results uh, uh, of IFC's COVID-19 response to SMEs. Um, uh, the best start uh, um, had the uh, existing trade finance scheme because uh, IFC uh, uh, is already active uh, uh, since more than 10 years uh, in the area of uh, uh, trade finance and due to the crisis uh, uh, they uh, extended this program and could rather quickly uh, have a big impact and uh, uh, that is also shown uh, by the fact that uh, uh, the first billion USD um, in the program was already used uh, after one month. In the meanwhile, the global trade finance program uh, already exceeded uh, the foreseen 2 million USD budget, uh, but IFC still continues uh, to provide more trade finance. Uh, the other three programs that I mentioned, um, they needed more preparation time. Uh, and so these uh, components only started uh, uh, in early May. Uh, the latest reporting that I saw last week showed that about 0 0.7 billion USD have already been utilized. And uh, what we hear from IFC management uh, in this week is that uh, they have, uh, uh, or there is a, a high number uh, of investment proposals right now in preparation um, and also uh, in circulation at the board. Uh, so IFC is expecting uh, that until the end of the fiscal year, uh, which is now uh, in the middle of next week, uh, IFC uh, will have uh, committed uh, about 3 billion USD. Didi, I just want to say we, the 30 second uh, rule, the wrap, if you could wrap up uh, in the next, uh, 30 seconds, one minute. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah, then uh, maybe we go to the last slide. Then I skip uh, uh, the MIGA, exactly. Um, so altogether, uh, what we see is uh, the, that the World Bank response package, which uh, uh, is amounting to 150 billion USD, uh, will be utilized uh, uh, in the next uh, 12 months. A part of it is already utilized, but uh, the bigger part is uh, uh, still to come. Um, what we uh, are doing uh, as a board of the World Bank right now, uh, we are discussing uh, about uh, the second phase of the COVID-19 response. And 
uh, there we will also have several pillars and one uh, of the pillars probably the most important uh, uh, for this forum here is uh, 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 the sustainable business growth uh, and uh, uh, job creation and also uh, IFC is now uh, in the process uh, of developing new ideas uh, and new instruments uh, to support uh, um, a resilient uh, and sustainable recovery of the MSMEs. Okay. I close here. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I had to fast forward there, right? But thank you. It's really helpful to have the uh, World Bank mapping of the different uh, paths to assistance um, and, and support. I, I think that was extremely helpful. Um, it's a big organization and you've kind of taken it apart so we can find the, the path that we need to do. Uh, Laurent Morin, uh, Senior Economist at the European Investment Bank, welcome. Uh, our question for you is, can you explain how the EIB has responded to the current crisis? What type of investments or financial support are you providing or offering for the private sector? Mr. Mahal, the floor is yours and uh, you have eight minutes. Is uh, Laurent, is he there? You're muted. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Can you hear me? Brilliant. Yes, we can. Thank okay, you. Okay, so uh, thank you. Sorry for that. Great. So let's move, to, let's move on because we are short in time. The presentation will be about EU corporates and COVID-19, the short and long-term challenges. And uh, as I spot in the next slide, can you move on, please, on the slide? Not before. The, okay, the COVID-19 crisis strongly affects firms. First, uh, for liquidity shortfall of corporates, and later, for trade-off between investment and leverage, debt increase to finance investment. And this, uh, this uh, sequencing of corporates' uh, adverse situation um, triggers, uh, leads to an optimal sequencing of policy intervention to avoid an investment collapse. I will develop this point in three, three parts. First, I will show you a bit of uh, macroeconomic development in the first uh, part of this presentation. Then I will go to the optimal sequencing of policy response, and then I will end with some concluding remarks. We can move to the next slide. Okay, so the next slide provides a broad picture about the COVID-19 developments across the European Union. As you can see on the left-hand chart, Industrial production has massively declined, has collapsed. The collapse not seen, not seen since at least World War II. The collapse was also accompanied by, a, by asymmetric response across EU member states, being less pronounced in the Netherlands and much more in Italy. So this was true at the country level. This was also true across sectors, as you can see on the chart on the right, uh, on the right part of the slide. Some sectors were much more affected than others. And uh, this is very important to be in mind uh, for the shape of the recovery. And the, the shock, the COVID shock, was in fact a constellation of shocks resulting from both supply and demand shock. Demand because the consumers were not able anymore to consume some of their products, and supply because of the disruption in global value chain. And so far, at least, we have not seen, as I will show in the next slide, a major disruption in the financial system. So we can move to the next slide. Uh, so what the next slide shows you is two things. First, that corporates have tapped uh, ECB, okay, bank loans, which have been themselves under ECB umbrella, is what you can see on the left with the sharp increase in corporate bank loans recorded over the last two months up to April. April. This was uh, for around uh, 190 billion for EU corporates, an unprecedented uh, record increase. And at the same time, there was a rise in the corporate bond yield for, uh, across the whole rating uh, spectrum. The rise uh, came from the beginning of the lockdown uh, late February up to the, the end of March. And since then, given the policy response implemented, the credibility of the ECB intervention, as well as the bold uh, national policy responses, the corporate bond yields have moved down, so they have started to normalize, and in fact, currently, they are uh, 
around uh, one half of their level at the peak of the crisis, but still above uh, the level at the beginning of the crisis. You should bear in mind that interpreting this chart is a bit complicated because at the same time, of, at the time of the decline, uh, corporates have changed from one rating category to another. They have been downgraded. So overall, the cost of, of uh, debt issuance for corporates is, uh, is a mixture of two things, a positive and a negative, and it's difficult to disentangle the proper evolution for, for specific corporates. We can move on. What, what we try to do in this slide, we have conducted at VID, we have conducted a, an exercise to assess the impact of the COVID crisis on corporate investment. And we have gone through a granular analysis of corporate balance, corporate balance sheet using your business database in order to see what could be the impact of the lockdown on net, uh, net revenue generated by corporates, non-financial corporates in the European Union. And in fact, what you can see is that there is a sizable impact which depends on the length of the normalization period, whether the, the economy, the EU economy will normalize uh, in the summer or whether it will need until uh, the end of the year to normalize, to fully normalize, as well as the, so this is the first parameter which guides the, the impact, as well as the, the parameter which illustrates the policy response. So if you have a strong policy response, the impact is less adverse for corporate, and if you have a longer normalization period, the impact is more adverse for corporate. And overall, what we find is something which is quite substantial in the range of uh, of uh, two to four percentage points of assets for large corporates, and even much more for SME, SMEs being more affected in the range of six to 11 percentage points of uh, total assets. So there is a substantial impact of the COVID crisis. This impact is going to be channeled through the balance sheet either by um, declining investment, corporate investment, or rising indebtedness. And it's what we call the trade-off which will emerge in order to keep uh, balance sheet ratio at uh, pre-crisis level, corporates will need to, uh, to really decline, decrease, push down their investment expenditure. And it's what you see on the chart on the right. So you have a choice between an investment decline, which is relatively moderate, but still sizable, of around one third, which is associated to a larger increase in debt, in leverage ratio, or preserve your leverage ratio, and have an even stronger decline in corporate investment. And this leads me to the second uh, part of this presentation, which is about the optimal sequencing of policy response. You can turn to the next slide. So there has been a constellation of uh, policy response in the European Union and even in the European Union member states. The most well-known are the SURE, the ESM credit facility, the IB program, there is ongoing, there are ongoing discussion on the next generation of EU policy response. I will have a bit, to, a bit more to say on this later. But overall, there has been a constellation of, uh, of measures which, are been, which have been very strong and nothing com and much more than compared to the 2008, 2012 uh, financial and sovereign debt crisis. And what is interesting is, uh, as you see in the next slide, is that this policy response has been sequenced uh, depending on the needs of corporate. First, the first issue at the beginning of the lockdown period was to postpone the payment of corporates which could not operate their uh, normal business. Then the second uh, strand of policy response was more addressed to liquidity and credit provision to corporate by the use of guarantees. And later, maybe to today already, the main problem is to preserve balance sheet ratios and to preserve the solvability of corporates which will face an increase in indebtedness so that they can continue spending on capital and doing capital expenditure. And for this, in terms of the in time of the recovery, what matters is equity and equity type instruments. And it's what is uh, the, the, the content of ongoing discussion for the new financial program. We can turn next. Right, so this program is still under discussion, as you know. It's a very comprehensive program, which is very sizable. It can reach up to 750 billion of euros, with almost one third in, uh, in uh, loans to EU member states and two thirds in grants. And it's, it's composed by several layers. And an interesting instrument is the solvency support instrument, 
which 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 respond to this necessity to uh, preserve balance sheet equilibrium for corporate and to find an instrument which will support uh, the leverage ratio in the sense that it could bring more equity or equity type instrument in the in the liability structure of corporate. Uh, Laurent, if you can, you could just, uh, we've got 30 more seconds. Okay, then uh, next slide, please. So now I can conclude. I think that what, what matters, what has to be reminded is that this time the bold policy response of European policymaker was there. So as, I've, as, I've, as I have shown you, but there are still huge uncertainties which remain. The sequencing of policy has been followed because corporates had first a problem of liquidity shortfall, but now they will have a problem of balance sheet solvability and equity mm -hmm. ratio. And in the long term, of course, we have to, in the recovery period, to think about climate, digitalization, and innovation. And we know that in this regard, Europe is a bit lagging behind the US yeah. uh, regarding energy efficiency, digital innovation, and venture capital. Okay. Thank you. This to, it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, sorry for the, the, the rush at the end. Uh, thank you for okay. that. Uh, just to say to our participants, all of these uh, these, the presentations will be made available to you. I know there's some eager uh, people in terms of getting access to the information from the World Bank and the EIB. So all of the presentations will be available on our website, as well as a recording of this, this, this gathering. So now let me turn to Dragan Loradic. He's head of the Small and Medium Enterprise Unit at the International Labor Organization. Welcome. Uh, so the ILO has published a series of global reports on the impact of COVID-19 on employment and business. So can you give us a, the latest figures on that impact on SMEs? Mr. Rajiv, the floor is yours for eight minutes. Uh, thank you very much and uh, thank you for inviting me. Very happy to be here. So uh, in my presentation, I'm going to touch on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on SMEs and I'm going to really focus on the SME unit response. And in fairness to other ILO colleagues in the enterprise department and outside, we are not the only one that works on that work in the area of SMEs, but, but this is our mandate. So I will really focus on what our unit is doing here. And basically, next slide, please. So the, the ILO uh, SME unit is part of the enterprises department uh, and the enterprises department is all about promotion of sustainable enterprises. And in the unit, we're focusing on our work in the area of productivity, inclusive entrepreneurship, enterprise formalization, market systems, value chain development work, and enabling environment for sustainable enterprises. So these are a couple of broad areas and quick introduction. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of numbers, this is quite interesting because um, Actually, already last year we have published uh, published uh, a report, small uh, matters, because uh, when people talk about SMEs, uh, they think this is one unified group, some people, uh, but, but they're not basically, because here when you see uh, uh, how the uh, employment is actually created, you would see that 70% of total employment globally is to be found actually in small economic units. Here we are talking about self-employed, micro enterprises and small enterprises. Alone, these three groups are uh, in charge of 70% of employment uh, globally. Now, um, they are big in numbers, they are important, they are uh, contributing to GDP between 40 to 60% in various countries, so it's all good, right? But individually, they are very fragile even on a good day because they struggle to, with access to finance. Uh, many of them are informal, uh, poor productivity, poor uh, working conditions, poor management practices in general, I'm, I'm speaking, and that's on a good day. But what happens when the day turns bad, like in the situation of COVID-19? Next slide, please. So in order to figure that out, we have conducted a global survey recently, um, and we've asked um, about 1,100 SMEs uh, in um, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. We couldn't actually cover Europe, unfortunately. And we wanted to understand the impact, but not only the impact, but also what kind of support is needed. So I'm going to quickly summarize. Even in April, 70% of businesses already said that they are temporarily or permanently stopping 
uh, their operations. They said, look, we are experiencing major cash flow crisis. Nine out of 10 said that. Problems on the supply side, you know, uh, no raw material, workforces, lockdown problems on demand side. Next slide, please. So we concluded based on this survey that, uh, you know, economic prospects uh, due to pandemic moving forward for SMEs are, are really grim worldwide. Uh, and uh, enterprise really needed quick assistance, in particular from government, because for small business, I, I've seen somebody mention it there, it is all about liquidity and cash, you know, and, and survival. So uh, the governments have responded quickly in most countries and have provided this immediate relief that was very welcomed. And the other thing that was needed then, and it's needed now is, it's, it's just there is a bit of complexity and, and, um, and not really much clarity as to what's happening post lockdown, you know, in terms of regulations. How do you need to behave? How do you open the business? what is needed so that clarity uh, is really much uh, needed there and in terms of direct interventions that's where we are very interested in really to hear also what was ne needed and what is still needed is definitely COVID-19 OSH guidance you know how do I return to business and start the business safely I need support I need uh, some kind of instructions and help and overall business uh, continuity, business advice, logistics. So this is what we've learned. Next slide, please. And as this is not enough, then we have a big elephant in the room on daily basis. And this is informality challenge, right? Because we know that 62% of the global workforce, according to ILO data, is engaged in informal economy. But what we wanted to, to know more, considering COVID-19 crisis, is we wanted to drill in really in the seven sectors that are uh, prone to COVID-19 closure and to look at who is providing jobs there. You know? And we actually discovered that self-employed and micro firms, we've created infographics, I can share it later, that self-employed and micro firms in those seven sectors provide over 800 million jobs alone. And out of 10 of these are actually in informal economy. Now, what we have now today, it is economic crisis and, and health crisis, but, but here, this is recipe for disaster for humanitarian crisis, you know, like 600 million people, if they don't go out to make a daily living, they don't eat. That's, that is a big policy challenge. Next slide, please. So how do we provide the immediate response, you know, from the, from the SME unit? Uh, our unit in, in Geneva, we have about 25 to 30 people. So the first thing, so we're not really huge. The first thing was really to contribute to enterprise department policy brief. I mean, we've seen from other presenters here, they talked about different phases. So we also have, you know, we are talking about exactly the same phases and we're proposing different policy response and enterprise level support in accordance to different phase. But then what we needed to do, and that's quite interesting, we challenge ourselves, you know, what do we need to change the way how we operate in the unit? Because what we've learned is that our distribution, our way of working, our, our distribution network of trainers, of experts, it's all in a parking lot. You know, nobody can actually go to visit enterprises. So how do we, what do we do? So we needed to, we needed to retool our offerings. We needed to digitalize quickly our existing offerings of our flagship products. We didn't even have necessarily all the money. So we did a bit of, um, we did a bit of crowdfunding, especially SIYB team, and that was very successful and innovative. So, so that was, this was quickly res responding to the crisis and reaching out to, to enterprises. And then what we needed to do, and that's critical, what we've heard is OSH COVID-19, help, help, help. So we needed to develop new product with our colleagues from specialists in, in OSH area, Lab Admin OSH. And then uh, with business continuity, ACTEMP uh, department took the lead there. They were already well ahead. Of, and, and with them, we then worked to develop a basic business continuity uh, program. And now we're developing that further. And we've got lots of requests on rapid assessment on, inf on informality in formal enterprises. What What's needed for them. So uh, then we realized also that we needed to create new partnerships. We can't do it alone. That those kind of challenges are huge. So we reached out to OECD, to UNTA, to UNDP, 
and yeah, there are concrete ideas that I can share later to private sector actors and internally to Vitek Temp. We are, as I said, working on business continuity, employment, and so on. And the last slide I'm concluding because I'm okay. mindful that you're yeah. watching the you have time. 15 seconds. Yeah, okay. So, very quickly, you know, we think really, and this is not a phrase, but is that not a really opportunity now to, to build something better for, for SMEs, for the small businesses, you know? That, that finally we got enabling business environment that is better now, that is more enabling. And that meso level, you know, that we actually do interventions that make mm -hmm. sense for particular sectors. At enterprise level, that we continue demand-driven interventions, that we have to do things differently on productivity. I've seen questions, you know, how do you address productivity, mm -hmm. not by uh, random interventions now and then, but holistically. And, and key and last point is, I think we need more engagement with ILO constituents here, in particular with employers organization through ECTEMP and also with SME agencies. We need to understand more what the mm -hmm. demands are. Yeah. So I'm stopping there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, the, the statistics were quite uh, quite uh, disturbing. Um, so we're just moving quickly on now. We're going to Rajesh Agarwal. Agarwal, are you with us? Yes. Thank you. Hello. So Hello. Rajesh is the chief. He's trade facilitation and policy for business, the division of market development at the International Trade Center. So Rajesh, as an organization dedicated to facilitating SME's capacity to do business across the globe, can you give us a short summary of ITC's findings on the impact of the crisis on SMEs? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you for inviting us to, be, to participate in this important uh, digital conference. As you already perhaps know, uh, International Trade Center is a joint technical assistance agency of the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. And our mandate is to support SMEs in developing and the least developed countries to enhance their international trade. And we use the hands-on approach to build capacity of SMEs as well as prepare them for effective business advocacy with their governments. Now these coming to the specifics, you know, we in the last two, three months, we have done this interviews with about 4,500 SMEs around the globe. And, you know, quite a lot of information has already been presented. Let me just put numbers, you know, to whatever has already been said, you know, coming to the end of the presentation. I mean, coming in the, at the end of this seminar as a last presenter, I think my life is a little bit easier in that sense. Uh, the next slide, uh, please. As you can see, uh, you know, it is 55% businesses across the globe. They reported that they have, there has been a severe negative impact from this crisis. Now, this slightly varies from region to region, but I think this 55% number is, is quite uh, significant and moderately affected another 30%. So in a way, you know, 85% are quite severely affected, I would say. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, obviously, different sectors, you know, this is a mapping of the different sectors. Everybody knows that accommodation and food, non-food manufacturing because of the supply side problems, retail, wholesale, travel, transport, these are the most adversely affected uh, sectors. So this is again captured in that survey. The next slide, uh, please. The SMEs are, or the MISMEs are most disproportionately affected. That, that's what it is showing. If the total is 55% in the severely uh, affected category, in the micro, amongst the micro, this is 64%. In the small, it is 60%. So you can see, smaller you are, the more adversely affected you are. So the next slide, uh, uh, please. I think this is a, quite a significant finding. 20%, one fifth of the misfits are at the risk of bankruptcies they are facing closure in the next three months. So that's, I think, uh, is quite a significant finding of this survey. Next, please. Uh, we have already talked about the government stimulus. We tried to map the stimulus which has been announced by various governments against their GDP values. You can see that not only that the richer countries are able to provide larger absolute you know dollars 
in health because of their large GDPs, but even as a percentage of their GDP, their support levels have been higher. You can see you know, Germany going to 60% of the GDP according to publicly available figures. And you know, Japan, France, Italy. Whereas if you see the developing countries, even though they are emerging, China, Brazil, India, Thailand, you know, these are 10% or below of the GDP. So you no, know, this has not only, you know, uh, in the immediate sense that you, know, you can provide this kind of support easily because you are rich, but over a longer period of time, if the support remains in place, it will alter the conditions of competitiveness in the international trade. And as a result, the resurgence of businesses from developing countries you know, can be affected just because of the alteration in the conditions of competitiveness. I just raised this point at this, uh, at this juncture. The next slide, please. Um, you know, it has already been said that, you know, the support has been to provide liquidity to businesses, uh, limiting corporate losses, etc. Let me not waste time because this point has been made by the previous speakers quite a lot. This is the you know mapping of all the support that we could capture essentially. Please go to the next slide. Now, I think this point was already made, but still it is captured in the interviews that in spite of the fact that governments have given support. But obviously, the smaller you are, the more difficult it is to access that information and benefit from the government. And you know, in a poorer country, in a developing in the least developed country, it becomes even more challenging because of quite a lot of informality which is built into the system. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, what we are hearing is that since value chains have been disrupted, so there's a lot of talk about moving towards more resilient value chains. And let me make one or two points. Uh, you know, uh, uh, next slide, please. The behavioral changes acquired during lockdown, they are likely to stay or they become a new normal. The consumer behavior surveys are pointing towards shift to e-commerce, which will, to substantial extent, will continue to be so. And the employer surveys point towards continuation of working from home for substantially higher proportion of employees. Now this gives us you know, the state of the new normal in a way which we are likely to face. And it has a bearing on what you should do to become resilient. The next slide, please. This is an opportune time to leapfrog to a digital economy. Let me, in the last two slides, explain, uh, you know, that what can private sector, especially SMEs, do to seize this opportunity? Now, use of ICT, advanced ICT tools for business processes like e-purchase, e-sales, and the supply chain management. You know, we have seen there is a lot of simple internet use. This knowledge is widespread. But the share of advanced applications declines with the degree of sophistication. And I think going forward, even the small and medium enterprises will have to acquire these advanced and sophisticated applications. The potential for big data analytics. analytics. And the key barriers to use of these tools is obviously the lack of awareness, access to finance, which we have talked about considerably uh, you know, in the previous uh, a speaker's uh, time, lack of skilled labor force or so skilling the workforce. That's an important component of this. And obviously, the point was also made about digital security and, and privacy. What we have seen is that in this, uh, you know, the ITC in its own projects, we have already started working directly with the SMEs because the demand is increasing. And my last point is that the governments, how can governments enable the shift to digitization of this economy. That's a, see, the point I'm trying to make is, and we have seen in the last two, three months, that there was already a move towards this, but the mindset of the bureaucratically determined governments has changed overnight. Now, we are in a position to accelerate this. So whether it's a creation of infrastructure and bridging the infrastructure deficit, or it is promoting e-government, trade facilitation reform, we were working for years to convince the governments that you know they should go for digitization, pre-arrival processing, e-payment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. you know, it was not 
you know, uh, taking us to that kind of uh, result. But overnight, this mindset has changed. So the point I'm trying to make is, and the appeal going forward is, iron is hot. Strike when the iron is hot. And this is what we are trying to do, you know, in our projects. And we are shifting even our trade facilitation support services towards digitization because we find a lot of receptivity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. You're, you're staying on eight minutes there. Thank you very much. So we have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, I have for the World Bank, Philippa, if you're there still. Uh, the, some of our colleagues are wanting to know, are insurance institutions an option for you as, your, as, as a means of channeling financing to SMEs? What are your thoughts? Uh, you mean uh, that um, uh, World Bank funding would be channeled uh, through insurances? Would you be agree? Would you work with the governments in terms of World Bank funding going to the government and then channeling the government channeling it through the insurance? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, what the World Bank is uh, doing, um, uh, they're working uh, uh, a lot with uh, governments uh, as well. Um, uh, and my presentation was now uh, mainly focused uh, uh, on the private sector arm uh, on IFC. Uh, but uh, the first uh, two institutions uh, uh, that I mentioned uh, uh, on the introductory slide, um, uh, the IBRD uh, uh, and IDA, they uh, are working uh, a lot with uh, uh, governments. And uh, uh, what they are doing right now is uh, uh, as uh, liquidity needs uh, uh, and financing for the governments uh, uh, are uh, uh, of utmost uh, importance, they are providing uh, so-called uh, uh, development policy loans, and that is funding which uh, the governments receive after they uh, uh, implemented uh, some sort of reforms. And uh, the reforms... Uh, uh, that the bank is uh, requesting in that regard. Uh, they go into the direction uh, of uh, what we heard that uh, uh, the SME sector or uh, the regulation uh, uh, for enterprises uh, uh, are reformed, uh, that uh, the financial sector uh, is reformed, but uh, uh, of course, uh, there is also a lot of uh, funding uh, then available uh, for the government uh, to buy PPE uh, or mm -hmm. to uh, increase their intensive care uh, capacity. So in that regard, uh, the bank uh, is also uh, uh, working uh, a lot with uh, the governments mm -hmm. and that support which is uh, uh, available there is uh, much higher mm -hmm. uh, than the one IFC is implementing. When we speak okay. uh, about uh, the government support, uh, uh, there the loan amounts uh, 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 are in the area of like 100 million uh, to 1 billion per country. And uh, in the last three months, uh, the World Bank or uh, IBRD uh, and IDA, uh, uh, they supported uh, already 100 countries uh, or more than 100 uh, countries. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, to help them uh, to tackle the impact okay. uh, uh, of the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I can I'd probably take that one on for a while. But there again, we have a rapid question for you, if you could quickly respond. How, it, what, what recommendations do you have for the, uh, in small SMEs who will need to balance the safeguarding of health of employees and at the same time trying to secure relief? I mean, what, what path should they be following? Where should they be looking for information? Rapidly, 30, 30, 30 seconds, one minute. I'll give you a minute. I think, the, I think the government should be providing those information and SME agencies because uh, every country would have a um, set of their rules uh, and guidelines uh, as to what needs to happen. The problem is, though, that those guidelines are not reaching the SMEs, or in some countries we've heard that the SMEs cannot start unless the inspector come in 
comes in and signed off that everything is okay. But SMEs don't, cannot wait for one or two inspectors to, to walk around 10,000 SMEs in the region. So things are not working out as well as they should. So SMEs are just starting. It's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really the challenge that they're, they're experiencing as slowly as we ease re restrictions. That is their big, uh, their big challenge. So thank you all very much for your, your very, very insightful uh, information. Um, we, as I said, we will be sharing the slides and the recording of this presentation on our website. And uh, Roberto, are you with us? Of course I am. Yeah, of well, course you uh, are. I know you. So Roberto, I'm going to pass hand over to you, uh, Roberto Suarez Santos, the executive, the ex secretary general of the IOE, for some final remarks. Roberto. Well, my my final remarks, first of all, have to do with the thanking thanking words to the distinguished participants from UNTAC, from the World Bank, from the International Trade Center. Of course, to our friends today a lot for the European Investment Bank and also to the distinguished ambassador of Uruguay, who also gave us an important insights on the work that they are doing also precisely on SMEs and, uh, and, and the focus uh, that we need to give now to the SME approach. Um, I just want to tell you that uh, from an IOE perspective, this is not just an exchange. What we want to do from out from here is to identify key action to work in a closer manner with you. Uh, what we have is an incredible network, an incredible network of key players at national level. Our organizations, the organizations belonging to IOE, are the ones normally being consulted by governments to define policies, policies that are really helping SMEs, of course all the companies, but the SMEs especially. So what we want is to identify how we can do better at this critical period with these institutions, with your institutions, to bring a better business environment. We have keep, keep saying that in the ILO, and uh, we are very known in the ILO and also in some of other employment forums. We are uh, the leading organization on employment and skills at global level. But what we always defend, you can never have proper jobs, decent jobs, this is the concept of ILO, if you do not have a proper business environment. It's a period of opportunity. You all have said that. You have referred to digital innovation, to digitalization, infrastructure, connectivity, also to the, to do the new way of making business. Let's leverage on this to create a business environment also which promotes transitions to our formality. That would be a key driver. And that will also help us to bring the, the decent jobs that we were looking for. So we will be producing in a very short time a kind of outcome out of this meeting. Uh, and uh, more than that, what we'll be is identifying areas of collaboration to strengthen cooperation with you for us to get a better future uh, for small and medium companies, but also for individuals. Thank you very much for listening to us and thank you to all participants. And also special thanks to my president who has been also attending all the, all the interventions. Thank you, Errol, also for joining us. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've just put in the chat also a link to our digital conference on Monday on COVID-19 and climate action. So please uh, take time to register for that. And I'd also like to thank you for your participation and your insightful and, and useful comments. Uh, I'd like to wish you all a good afternoon, good evening, uh, good day. And we'll be, uh, this is the beginning of a partnership. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.